it going everybody? It's Mr. White here with your Unit 12 test review all about World War One. You're going to want to get out your test review paper, so if you don't have one, make sure you go to my website and download it. Just check the web address on your screen. Uh, and without further ado, let's just go ahead and get right into this test review. So the first thing it wants to know about in your test review is the main causes of World War One. Remember that Maine is an acronym to help you remember the causes of World War One. The M in Maine stands for militarism. That's when countries were increasing the size and strength of their military to compete with one another. The A in Maine stands for alliances. Remember that during this time period, countries were politically tied to one another, and the idea was that it was going to balance the power of Europe. Next up, the I stands for imperialism. Remember that countries in Europe were establishing control over other nations to gain more resources and ultimately to gain more power. And then the N in Maine stands for nationalism. Nationalism means loyalty to a group of people or a culture over your country. So we talked about how there were two main kinds of nationalism, pan-Slavic nationalism and pan-German nationalism that eventually led to World War I. Okay, next up it wants to know about the members of the two alliances. So we talked about how alliances was one of the main causes of World War I. The two main alliances were called the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. The Triple Entente was made up of France, Russia, and Britain. This one's kind of easy to remember because even the word Entente sounds French. So remember that the Triple Entente was the one with France. All right, now the other alliance was the Triple Alliance. Uh, they were also known as the Central Powers during World War I. And the Triple Alliance was made up of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and uh, Italy, but remember that Italy uh, kind of broke their part of the deal and ended up switching sides at the beginning of World War I. All right, so next up, it wants to know about the spark. Remember, the spark means like what actually started World War I. Well, the spark that started World War I was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Remember that he was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. All right, next up, which country started the war? Well, it was actually Austria-Hungary that started the war. You might remember that when their Archduke was assassinated, they put some really intolerable demands on the little country of Serbia. Serbia had no choice, they couldn't give in to the demand to give up their sovereignty, and so Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. So just check this map right here, and you can see Austria-Hungary. Yeah, they're that big old country right there. And then Serbia is that smaller country just to the south of them. It's going to be really important for you to remember where Austria-Hungary is located because you're going to need to know that on the test. All right, next up. Um, the reasons for America to enter the war. So y'all might remember from that little uh, gallery walk we did, there was kind of a funny little slang term called sluts, yeah, S-L-U-T-Z, that can help you remember the reasons why the United States of America got involved in World War I. The S in sluts stands for the Sussex Pledge, which was basically an agreement that Germany broke, which said that they were no longer going to do unrestricted submarine warfare. Of course, we know that they kept doing the unrestricted submarine warfare. Next up, the L in sluts stands for Lusitania. The Lusitania was a British passenger ship that was carrying U.S. passengers to Great Britain. This passenger ship was sunken by a German U-boat. Remember, U-boats are submarines. And almost 200 Americans died. Next up, the U in sluts stands for unrestricted submarine warfare. It's so right there, the first three have to do with submarines. You should know that was a big deal. Um, remember that German U-boats were sinking Allied ships, and so that was a big deal. Next up, the T in sluts is ties to Great Britain. Uh, remember that the U.S. and Britain share a lot of cultural aspects, like, for example, our language, uh, mostly uh, English, and, of course, the, the Protestant religion, Protestant Christianity is the main religion of both countries. Uh, we're both capitalists, so there's a ton of reasons why we were tied to Britain. And then last of all, the Zimmerman telegram. Remember, that was a note from the ambassador to Mexico from Germany asking Mexico to attack the USA to prevent the USA from entering World War I. That was something that when the U.S. found out about, uh, it made us very angry and eventually uh, provoked us to declare war against Germany. All right, so next up, new technology. 
So uh, there were lots of new kinds of technology in World War One, like machine gun and poison gas, airplanes, tanks, um, hand grenades, uh, etc. So all these new technologies allowed soldiers to kill more enemies more rapidly and generally from a greater distance. Okay, um, because of the deadly nature of all this new technology, you might remember that trenches became the new strategy for surviving through the war. Trenches were the only protection that soldiers had to keep them safe. And uh, another new technology that was really coming into its own during World War I was submarine technology. Uh, the Germans called them Untersiebel, and so that's why we sometimes call them U-boats. Uh, the U-boats were used to disrupt shipping and also to prevent enemies from, uh, the German enemies from getting supplies. Um, Eventually, all this new technology resulted in a stalemate on the Western Front. Remember that stalemate means that nobody's winning and nobody's losing. It's just sort of like a tie. All right, so speaking of trench warfare, that's the next bullet. Um, trench warfare means that soldiers fought by digging long ditches into the ground, and the ditches were designed to protect soldiers from machine gun and artillery fire. Uh, in case you forgot what artillery is, that's those giant cannons that shoot bombs miles away. Um, eventually the soldiers uh, had to dig down into these trenches and, and they were not a very nice place to live. Remember that the soldiers were exposed to the elements like heat and cold, rain and snow and wind and even things like insects and rats. Um, and of course the only thing the soldiers had to protect them were improvised uh, scraps. Things like for example uh, boards or sheets of metal canvas, kind of just whatever they had laying around that they could use to sort of cover themselves in these ditches. Um, so trenches were not a very nice place to be. Next up, total war. Uh, total war means that all the resources in a country are devoted to the war effort. So that means that even civilians back home are involved in helping their soldiers defeat the enemy. Um, so an example of total war would be things like rationing your food or calling on civilians to serve in factories to produce weapons for the war. Um, next up, it wants to know about propaganda. And, you know, propaganda kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of total war. Um, you remember seeing a lot of these posters. Uh, these posters were used to try to encourage people uh, either to participate in the war directly by joining up as a soldier or to participate in the war indirectly by doing things like buying war bonds. Um, Propaganda is basically just persuasive advertising, and the whole point is to convince people to support the war. Um, generally, propaganda tries to dehumanize the other side uh, and emphasize the virtues of the country that's producing the propaganda. All right, next up, uh, it wants to know about World War I's impacts. So uh, there were several impacts. One of the most important political impacts is that the Russian and German governments were overthrown um, and the map of Europe was totally redrawn. Next up, uh, an economic impact of World War I was that Europe's economy was ruined. Uh, you know, four years of really destructive fighting made it hard for anybody to do business in Europe. The material cost of this was very high and Germany was forced to pay reparations to pay for all the huge costs associated with the damages of World War I. Uh, social impacts were things like food shortages, and this was mostly caused by a huge decline in European agriculture. This led to famine and malnutrition all over the world in many different regions. And so that would be an important social impact. All right, next up, uh, it wants to know about the Russian Revolution's causes. Um, there were many things that caused the Russian Revolution to happen. Uh, but for one thing, it, they, they had a problem with the kind of government they had. Remember that Russia still had an absolute ruler, Tsar Nicholas II. Um, he was a really unjust person who caused a lot of suffering to the Russian people. Uh, the people were basically still living under feudalism at this time. And so uh, that was one of the main causes for the Russian Revolution. But there were several other things. You might remember there was that slogan, Peace, Land, and Bread. Well, that kind of talks about the grievances that the Russian people had. For one thing, they wanted peace. Remember that Russia was suffering really heavy casualties in World War I. So they wanted their country to pull out of World War I so they could have peace. Next up, land. At this time, Russian people were mostly not allowed to own land. 
only the, the very rich, noble aristocrats were the ones who were allowed to own land. So common people wanted to have the right to own land. That's the land part of peace land and bread. And then the last part, bread, uh, it, it's pretty obvious. There wasn't enough food. People were starving. And so they were hoping that the government could provide them with a steady source of food. And that was the bread part. Um, this all led to things like riots. And in 1917, there were some pretty serious riots in a city called Petrograd. Um, what was really amazing about these riots is that the soldiers who were sent to put the riot down actually ended up joining the riot. And uh, this just further emboldened the Russian revolutionaries. Um, eventually, their leader, Vladimir Lenin, returned from exile. Uh, he took the lead of the Bolshevik party. And eventually, the Bolsheviks seized power in November of 1917. This is when Russia became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR. And they also quit out of World War I. This caused them to lose a lot of land to Germany. Um, and it really put the Allies in a pretty tough spot. Luckily, the United States joined up right around that same time. Now, uh, next up, it wants to know about the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles was the peace treaty that ended World War I. And it's really important for you to remember that it was pretty unfair towards one country in particular, and that was Germany. Remember that Germany had to accept total responsibility for World War I. This meant that they had to surrender territory to the Allies, uh, they had to make reparation payments to pay for all the damages of the war. And it, they also had to agree to greatly reduce the size of their own military, down to almost nothing. Um, one of the good sides of the Treaty of Versailles was that it created the League of Nations, which was sort of like the predecessor to the United Nations and one of the first international bodies that was created to try to preserve peace. Um, if you want to talk about good things, you also got to talk about the bad things. Another thing about the Treaty of Versailles is it created something called a mandate system. Uh, the mandate system was used to divide up the territories lost by the central powers. And then last of all, um, something that affected our world today from the Treaty of Versailles is that the borders of Europe were changed. Um, they were reshaped as new countries were created and old countries were broken apart. And so the map of, of Europe that we know today started taking shape at the end of World War I. All right, so next up, President Wilson's 14 points. Um, president Wilson, we're talking Woodrow Wilson, was the president of the United States during World War I. He created a list of 14 recommendations for ways to preserve peace, and these became known as the 14 points. Um, some of the most important of the 14 points were the things like the creation of a League of Nations. Uh, the League of Nations, like I said, became the predecessor to the United Nations, and it was an international body that was created to try to preserve peace in the future. Um, it was supposed to keep international tension from leading to another war. Another important part of the, the 14 points was the idea of national self-determination. Now, that's a really complicated sounding term, but it's pretty basic. It simply means that people should be free to choose the kind of government that they live under. They should have self-rule, essentially. Um, this was completely opposed to the idea of imperialism, because if you think about it, imperialism is one country forcing a government on another part of the world. So Wilson was basically arguing that sovereignty should be based on the best interests of the people. So the people should not be ruled by some foreign dictator or some overseas monarch. They should be allowed to decide what country they want to be a part of. All right, so uh, next up, League of Nations, kind of goes along with what we were just talking about. Uh, like I said, the League of Nations was an international group that was set up to prevent the outbreak of war. Uh, they wanted to stop World War II from happening, but as you can tell, they weren't very successful to that end. Um, it was founded based on Wilson's 14 points, and it established the mandate system like we just talked about, uh, which divided up the colonies of the central powers. And eventually it became a failure because they had no military of their own, so they couldn't enforce a lot of the decisions that were made at the League of Nations. And another big problem with the League of Nations is that it it did not include every nation in the world. So some nations didn't really have an outlet to air their grievances or to negotiate with others. So that was why the League of Nations wasn't really successful in the end. Okay, so that's it for the World War I section. Uh, there are going to be about five review questions on this one. So let's just go over some of these concepts that we've learned this semester that are going to be in the review section. Uh, the first one talks about the Renaissance.
Now, the Renaissance had several impacts on Western Europe, and you've seen this question before, so this should sound familiar. For one thing, uh, the art and architecture became more secular. Remember that secular means non-religious. So now instead of always just having paintings of church themes, they started having paintings of things that were just like everyday life. Uh, the other thing was that people started writing about their own expressions and feelings in the vernacular language of their country. In case you forgot, vernacular means the native language or the most common language spoken in a certain place. So like for example, here in Texas, the vernacular would be English, and in some parts of Texas, probably Spanish. Um, next up, trade increased, and as there became more trade, ideas began to spread more quickly. And one last important thing about the impact of the Renaissance on Western Europe was that the Catholic Church lost power, but the monarchs of Europe began to gain more power. Okay, so remember those as important impacts. Next up, the Enlightenment. Uh, in case you forgot, the Enlightenment was that time period where people began using science and reason to not only understand the world, but try, to try to figure out the best way to live and the best kind of government to have. So a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment relate to how a government should work, and these should sound kind of familiar. For one thing, remember that uh, guys like John Locke said that the government should protect people's natural rights. Remember that natural rights are those unalienable rights, like life, liberty, and property. And if a government fails to protect the people's natural rights, then the government can be overthrown. Now, another important idea of the Enlightenment was the idea of separation of powers. Separation of powers, also known as checks and balances, uh, divides up the government into an executive, judicial, and legislative branch. Those branches check on each other and they balance each other so that no one part of the government can become tyrannical and have too much power. Uh, and then next up, uh, another important idea of the Enlightenment is that the government gets its power from the consent of the governed. This is called popular sovereignty, and this kind of goes along with that first concept we talked about of how if the government doesn't protect the people's rights, they can overthrow the government. Essentially, the people run the government. All right. Uh, the last things it wants to know about are free enterprise and communism. Uh, free enterprise is an economic system where the people can own the factors of production and make their own decisions about them. So the people get to answer those economic questions of what to make and how to make it and who gets it. Um, that's also known as capitalism, and it's pretty close to the kind of system we have here in the U.S. Now, the other kind of economy is called a command economy. And remember that command economy is also known as communism. This is the kind of economic system where the government controls all the businesses and controls all the factors of production. So all the industries are government controlled. The government gets to decide how much to produce and, and what to produce and who gets the things that are produced. And government councils control the price of goods, and they also regulate how much of certain goods are produced. Um, in this kind of system, even farmers have to live together on these collective farms. Collective farms are owned by the government, and everything that the farmers produce just goes to the government and then gets divided up evenly among the population. So if you're a farmer who makes a lot of food, you don't necessarily get to keep all that food for yourself. It all goes to the government, and then the government divides it up. All right, guys. Well, I think now we are at the end of our test review. So uh, make sure that you go over all these concepts that we just talked about. And also make sure that you look at that last little section of your test review. That's where it tells you about the possible essay questions. Now, if you're in on level, you're going to have to answer one of those two questions. If you're in K level, you know that you're going to have to answer two of those questions. So please make sure that you take the time Look at those, come up with a sort of a list of things you'd want to talk about for each one, and prepare yourself for responding to at least one, or if you're in K-level, two of those essay prompts on the day of the test. If you have any questions, of course, come see me, uh, and good luck on your test, guys.